We're going to take a turn into the somewhat more esoteric uh, topics in urology at this point. I think a lot of what we've done so far are very practical, very application-based. This talk is going to be a lot more basic science, and I, hopefully that will keep you engaged and will make it compelling, because I do think it will inform where we go in the future and the treatments we will have available for our patients, and certainly things that patients are going to come in and ask about and want to know about, and being armed with some knowledge about it will certainly be to your advantage. Uh, as before, no disclosures commercially in the past 16 months. The learning objectives here is to, again, understand what's going on with shockwave therapy, some distinctions between different forms of energy, uh, some data that are out there from the basic science world, and also recognize where the limitations are and the things that are keeping this from being, at this time at least, something that's quite ready for prime time. Well, first off, we'll distinguish shockwave therapy. What is it? It's the passage of acoustic shockwaves through tissues, a point of convergence as noted where the energy is focused, and ultimately that transfers energy to the tissue, which is measured in a unit called energy flux density. There's different densities that are used for different applications. When talking about applications in andrology for erectile dysfunction, it is on the order of 0.25 millijoules per millimeter squared of tissue. The first report of this uh, for use in managing ED was by Yoram Vardy, a urologist from Israel who pioneered this technique for the management of erectile dysfunction. Some of you may be familiar with data from earlier in this millennium, the 2000s, when there was interest in using shockwave therapy for management of Peyronie's disease. There were probably at least four or five different articles that came out, all of which really convincingly demonstrated no real apparent changes in penile curvature, some expedition of resolution of pain, but nothing that was really dramatically clinically useful for patients, and therefore it never quite caught on for Peyronie's. It is, however, achieving new life and new interest for the management of erectile dysfunction. For context, we're all familiar with the use of shockwave therapy in the management of renal stones. Uh, it's important to note here the orders of magnitude of difference we're talking about when we discuss the shockwave energy that is applied to break up a hard kidney stone versus that applied to soft tissues. That's sort of self-evident and self-explanatory, but putting in context here the different degrees we'll use. Shockwave therapy is used in multiple other fields of medicine, prominently in orthopedics for management of joint issues, bone issues, et cetera. And more recently, uh, cardiologists became interested in this as a way to generate new blood vessels, angiogenesis. And from there, it's obviously a relatively short walk to go from angiogenesis and blood vessels in the heart to discussing blood vessels in the penis and how it might be relevant for erectile dysfunction. It's important to note a very relevant distinction in shockwave therapy. There are a lot of devices out there, energy transfer means that are being promoted for management of erectile dysfunction. The data, the robust data, is on specifically shockwave treatment, not radial pulse waves, but shockwave treatment. So with the shockwave, you have what you see right here, very rapid uptick in pressure, peaking at a relatively high intensity, and then a downward curve, basically a, a slow decreased pressure wave that creates sort of a negative pressure after the wave is initially passed. This is distinct from radial pressure, which is used sometimes in orthopedics, cosmetics, et cetera, which is more of a sine wave energy transfer, much less focal, more diffuse throughout the tissue and sort of a self-propagating thing versus a focused burst of energy directed at a certain target. The relevance of this was demonstrated in a study looking at, uh, these are epithelial renal cells in a study by Lee in 2018, demonstrating here we have a resting state cell at the peak pressure, uh, at the point when the shock wave really hits the tissue, there is a compressive phase where the cell actually contracts by a very, very small margin, but it is a cellular contraction that's subsequently followed by an expansile phase during this later part of the pressure wave, the cell actually expands. So you can see at the cellular level, there is transfer of energy, there is change in the tissue, and this actually has a great deal of relevance for things that we'll get into momentarily. So ultimately, how do you turn that mechanical energy? How does it not just damage the cell? How does it turn into some kind of chemical message? Well, there are actually membrane brown receptors which take mechanical pressure, take mechanical signals, and transduce them into biochemical signals inside the cell for cell signaling. One of the more prominent amongst these is called piezo. This is a diagram of piezo, the mouse version, which is a membrane brown receptor protein that actually transduces uh, mechanical pressures. And the way it works, this is in the resting state. You can see the sort of uh, tri-bladed uh, protein sitting on top of the membrane. When a pressure wave hits, this is modified in a way that it goes from this 
uh, resting state where the ion channel here is blocked, uh, blocked off, to being a resting state where uh, ions can move through, sodium, calcium ions, et cetera, can transduce. So this is how the mechanical signal converts to a chemical one, which can have ramifications for cellular biology. And here we have, again, a simplified uh, version of that. What you'll see here is, again, something you're probably all familiar with from biochemistry classes or back in medical school or even college, looking at how cellular transduction works. You have your membrane-bound receptor, the signal is transmitted, ion channels start to flow in, and then you have, through a number of downstream effectors, uh, cellular changes. And I won't go into the details of that at this slide, but we'll give you some highlights of what we think is happening in shockwave therapy for ED later on in the presentation. So having established that shock waves can transfer energy, they can do something to tissues and make things change in a cell without damaging them necessarily, what do we know about how it's used in erectile dysfunction? Well, uh, Raul, Raul Calvijo, who's up at UC Davis now, did a meta-analysis of existing studies, again, looking at intense, low intensity shock wave treatment for erectile dysfunction, identifying seven trials, 602 men, relatively short periods of follow-up, but they were the kind of patients you're likely to see in your clinic. Uh, men with a mean age of around 60, erectile dysfunction on the severe range, again, the mean being 9.2, so qualifying for severe ED, but certainly a range around that, and men with neurogenic ED excluded, importantly because we do think that many of the benefits of shockwave therapy are derived from vascular benefits, and therefore we wanted to focus on those for these studies that have been done. Royal we'll found uh, in this study, again, relatively short follow-up, only 20 weeks total, a significant improvement in erectile function scores between baseline and at follow-up. And importantly, these were all placebo-controlled studies with ED as the primary endpoint. There are other data out there that look at uh, the use of shockwaves for Peyronie's disease. Those data were excluded because this ED was not the primary endpoint in those particular studies. What you see here on this axis, again, looking at the treatment group versus control group, and then the between group differences, demonstrating a mean of about a four-point improvement in erectile function score between the treatment group and the control group. That does meet the criteria for what is sort of, uh, I wouldn't say arbitrarily, but sort of defined as the minimally important clinical difference. If you look at IIEF scores, a four-point change is broadly considered to be significant, although, as I mentioned in my erectile dysfunction talk earlier, there is a range. And what's a clinically important change for a man with mild ED is different from that from a man with more severe uh, phenotype of the condition. So therefore, this relatively modest change is probably going to help out more on the mild end of the ED spectrum. But certainly a compelling set of data that suggested there was a signal here that this might be something that can work for patients. So why do we think it works? Again, it seems somewhat counterintuitive to apply energy and even micro damage to an uh, organ to make it better. You know, what data do we have to support how this might work and how it might be relevant and how we can justify using it from a biochemical evidence-based approach? There are a number of cl uh, preclinical studies, primarily using rodent models, largely diabetic, uh, either streptozoidin induced or fatty rats, such as Zucker diabetic fatty rats, a number of other animal models uh, included as well. And pretty much across the board, any time functional studies were done in these rodents, improvements were noted. Uh, again, you may or may not be familiar with these sorts of charts. These are what's called intracavernous pressure measurements. It's basically a technique to assess the reactivity of the penile tissue of a rat to electrical stimulation of the cavernous nerve. So basically, you see in the control situation here, very rapid increase in intracavernous pressure consistent with an erection response compared to the bilateral cavernous nerve injury model where you have a very blunted response. Again, this sort of replicates what we see in radical prostatectomy patients. In this study uh, from Korea, it's actually a combination of both stem cells and shockwave and the combination together. You'll note that across the board, looking at mean values, there was a significant improvement in treated rats versus those that were untreated. So again, a compelling rationale from the basic science side that there is something going on here, that these shockwaves are administering some benefit to these animals. So purported mechanisms, and again, this is not an entirely exhaustive list, but it hits the highlights of different mechanisms by which shockwave energy transfer is thought to potentially be relevant to uh, erectile function recovery. So going through them briefly, again, starting off with looking at how shockwave therapy has been shown to change nitric oxide signaling. This is a study looking at uh, human uh, umbilical vein endothelial cells, uh, a common model system for endothelial studies. This is not an erectile function study, but looking at this study, they found that treating these cells with shock waves in vitro led to significant enhancements in uh, expression of ENOS to a certain point. 
you'll see that once they got to uh, 1,500 shocks, the expression declined. And this underscores an important point that is important for how we apply this to, to patients. There is probably a threshold. You know, there's a certain point at which the energy transfer is probably beneficial, but going beyond that, you're likely to cause damage. And potentially setting that threshold is gonna be really important for when we apply this clinically, if we do. Other important things, a uh, study here looking at a different mechanism, again, staying in the vasodilation side. We have plenty of other studies suggesting this nitric oxide benefit, but also some changes in uh, cellular receptors. This study looking, again, at penile tissue in rodents with hypertension, demonstrating an increase in expression of the vasodilatory alpha-2 receptor and a decline in the vasoconstrictive alpha-1. So, again, multiple mechanisms here suggesting how there might be benefit in terms of vascular status. Again, looking specifically here at shockwave treated rats and NOS expression in penile tissues. We have here again that same study out of Korea, and it doesn't show up terribly well, but the red uh, coloring here on these slides are, N are NOS positive cells. And you can see again, looking at the cavernous nerve injured group versus the treatment groups, significantly greater expression of the red NOS expressing tissues compared to the treatment arm. And again, a similar study out of our lab at UCSF, Tom Liu's lab uh, and the team that works there with him, again, demonstrating improvement in NOS expression, primarily in the cavernous tissues. And again, it's, it's hard to see from the expression, but here we have sham animals, uh, tr uh, cavernous nerve injury animals, and then low and high intensity treatment with shock waves. This is the most relevant diagram because it speaks to the uh, dorsal penile nerves in which you can see substantially better expression of the red NOS positive cells in the treated animals versus the, control, uh, the untreated uh, cavernous nerve injury animals. So NOS activity, vasoactive, uh, vasoactive activity, uh, anti-inflammatory effects as well. There are data to support the notion that shockwave reduces expression of inflammatory markers. Here we have again a study looking at the same human uh, umbilical vein uh, endothelial cells treated with lipopolysaccharide, so basically a model of inflammation, a very well-established model to create inflammatory conditions. And in this study, treatment with a, a shockwave therapy actually reversed the inflammation-reduced expression of, of ENOS. So again, in a suggestion that the inflammation reduction of shockwave therapy can lead to vascular benefit. Another study here looking again at coronary ischemia. Again, we're not talking about penile tissue here, but in coronary tissue, an improvement after shockwave treatment of these coronary cells, a reduction in the total number of macrophages infiltrating after ischemia, so less macrophage, but the M2 subtype, that is to say the reconstructive, the cellular healing phenotype of macrophages, was actually increased. So a reduction in overall inflammation from the enhancement of the cells that are likely to lead to actually beneficial remodel and wound healing as opposed to scar tissue deposition. And a study here again, looking now at penile tissue from our uh, lab at UCSF, looking at uh, advanced glycosylation end products, which are a, a cellular inflammatory marker present in diabetic animals, looking again at the reduction you get uh, with treatment with shock waves in that particular marker. So again, very robust evidence suggesting across different tissue types that shock wave therapy can reduce inflammation. Angiogenesis, again, I had mentioned that a lot of the interest in shockwave therapy comes from cardiology literature, looking at trying to generate new blood vessels and angiogenesis. Well, there are data to suggest that ESWT activates or upregulates expression of VEGF and angiopoietin. This has been associated in several animal models with improved wound healing. Uh, these animals use standardized wound techniques to create a wound that is going to heal a certain way, and shockwave therapy seems to enhance that from the plastic surgery literature. And in corporal tissue, we have data to suggest that there's increased expression of von Willebrand factor and also endothelial cell markers. Here we have, again, our study looking at cavernous nerve injured rats, control animals right here, I'm sorry, uh, uh, sham animals here, control animals here that have the in, uh, diabetes but not the uh, supplementation with shockwave, very little endothelial cell expression. And then here we have uh, much more robust expression of endothelial antigens in the treated animals. So stem cells are, again, I'm looking forward to hearing Ryan's talk, because stem cells are another kind of whole field of uh, andrology and sexual medicine preservation of erections that is going to be of great interest. There's a notion that in some ways you can actually activate resident populations of progenitor or stem cells with energy transfer like this. And again, here we have data, looking back actually 13 years now, looking at animals with a standardized hind leg ischemia model, treating them with shockwave therapy 
noting an increased expression of SDF1, which is a stem cell homing factor, which tends to attract stem cells into that particular area and make them grow. Uh, again, another study here looking at another uh, wound animal model, ischemia model, outside of the sexual dysfunction space, and then work that's been done at UCSF, again, now back into the erectile function space, we have here data looking at EDU-labeled cells. EDU is a cellular marker. We use it at the UCSF lab as a tracking mechanism because EDU-expressing cells, if the EDU is administered to a juvenile rat, they tend to be markers for stem cells. And here you see across the board, looking at controls versus the animals that receive shock waves, markedly greater expression of EDU-positive cells. This is interesting data, and again, I want to highlight it. It's far removed from what we do in urology, but it is a nature paper. So I think anything, anything, it's, anytime anything gets published in nature, it is worth taking note of. This is looking at Drosophila intraendocrine midgut cells. Way afield of what we're talking about in terms of clinical application. But this was a demonstration in vivo, and it was prominent enough that it made nature that they were able to demonstrate in vitro that mechanical transduction did lead to cellular uh, changes. In this case, activation of progenitor cells. Now, this model is different, obviously, from what we're talking about, but it's very seminal work in the fact that it is getting at how this happens in vivo, too. You can actually have this happen not just to cells in a dish or a rat in a cage, but in a living system. And I think there's a lot of excitement about what this represents in terms of how this is actually working. Nerve regeneration, again, I've focused on vascular issues, inflammatory issues as a primary driver of how these treatment might work, but there are data to suggest that application of shock waves can be beneficial in terms of regeneration. Here we have data, again, a sciatic nerve injury model in rats looking at myelination of nerves. You see, first off, the shockwave group, number one, had better recovery three weeks post-injury. They also noted much less infiltration of inflammatory cells. These are the inflammatory cells in the untreated animals versus the treated animals, and then further on down the line, looking at myelination, markedly improved myelination of nerve sheaths here in the treated animals versus the controls. And the hypothesis is that actually enhanced Wallerian degeneration, basically getting the nerves to break down that myelin sheaths that much faster, helps them restore themselves that much faster too. And the potential utilization of this could be very relevant in erectile dysfunction from uh, cavernous nerve injury, such as with radical prostatectomy. If you can get the nerves to regenerate that much faster, you theoretically might restore erectile function and prevent some of the vascular changes, the tissue changes that are very common in the penis of men who have had radical prostatectomy. Uh, tissue remodeling, again, I'll say that there are data to suggest, again, looking at inflammatory markers, cellular signaling markers, that shockwave therapy can reduce these kind of issues. And actually, in this study from our group, uh, actually, it's a group we collaborate with in China, preservation of elastin fibers, so elasticity preservation in the penis, obviously relevant to the capacity to attain erections and prevent vascular um, venous leak. And again, another study looking, again, this group from Korea that I quote quite a bit, showing some other architectural changes in the penis, so preservation of smooth muscle actin, reduced apoptosis in treated animals. So again, more compelling evidence there. So having presented this kind of reams of different data from across different disciplines, well, what are we left with and why aren't we doing this right now? Well, I'll say that ultimately we haven't quite worked out with perfection yet what is the optimal dosing? How many shots do people need? What interval should they receive these shots? And does that vary? You know, in an individual patient, is there a one-size-fits-all approach? Or do we need to really delve down and determine which patient gets which protocol of shocks? I'll also say that there are data to suggest that the improvement that you see with erection function is on the, um, it's not dramatic. It's a six-point improvement in IIEF compared to a two-point improvement with placebo. So relevant, potentially useful for a lot of patients, but not necessarily something that's going to, as I say, uh, take the patient with severe ED and put them into a, a normal category. So another way to say that, this treatment will not raise the dead. Uh, you're not going to take a patient with severe ED and put them in a situation where they're 18 again. However, I would say that in the mild to mild moderate category, you might find patients who will benefit from this, who will move into the not needing treatment uh, phase. Theoretically, at least, you might take a patient who has very severe ED, not responding to any therapy. Is it possible you will salvage them to some extent and put them into an area where they will respond to therapy? It's, it's intriguing to think about and compelling, and I think it's worthy of research. Uh, and I think that it could be very useful, again, based on those data about Wallerian degeneration, that shockwave treatment could be a component of penile rehabilitation after radical pelvic surgery. So I'll say it's very promising. We're very excited about the potential. There are a lot of things that need to be worked out. And I'll just caution that 
make sure that when you're talking about these data with any kind of rep or anyone else, you're talking about the shock wave treatments, not the pulsed wave radiation or the pulsed wave uh, pressure waves, which are slightly different. Uh, thank you for your attention.